Thank you for giving me the opportunity to give a talk here, and I apologize if I'm the only one between you and your coffee break, but uh, my name is Vivek Narsimhan. I'm a professor at Purdue University, and today I'll talk to you about some of the work I did during my PhD with uh, Eric Schockfe and Susan Muller, and I'll talk at the second half of my talk of some of the current work I'm doing right now as a professor at Purdue. So the first part of my talk is I want to understand the dynamics of vesicles under flow. In particular, we're going to be looking at one type of flow, which is in the hyperbolic flow field, as shown here. The reason why we're interested in this is when um, soft materials, such as vesicles, are placed in these type of flows, they undergo some very strange shape transitions that we want to understand in a bit more detail. So what exactly is a vesicle? A vesicle is a sac of fluid enclosed by a phospholipid bilayer, and these entities are important from both a biological standpoint as well as an engineering standpoint. From a biological standpoint, vesicles are commonly used to store and transport nutrients within the cell, and they're implicated in many different um, biological uh, functions, such as secretion, trafficking, signaling, and storage. From an engineering standpoint, vesicles are commonly used to encapsulate nanoparticles in drug delivery. Um, this is what people call as liposomes in the literature. Right? Now, from a biophysical standpoint, uh, vesicles are also an important model system for all types of biological membranes because the primary component of all biological membranes is a phospholipid bilayer. In fact, in the past 30 years, people have uh, looked at vesicles as model systems to understand all types of physical chemical processes that happen in cells, such as fusion, budding, and fission, etc. Right? Because of all these reasons, there's a lot of interest in understanding um, the mechanical stability of vesicles. In other words, the conditions under which vesicles will become unstable and perhaps break up. Okay? But now we have a decent idea, maybe not the best idea, but a decent idea of how spherical vesicles break up. Basically, when the tension on the membrane is above a critical value, what ends up happening is the membrane will form transient pores on the membrane. And this is the idea behind electroporation that people use typically to introduce transient pores into the network so that you can introduce uh, DNA into it and you know, do something like gene delivery. But, DNA, but, um, but vesicles do not necessarily have to be uh, spherical. If they're placed in a chemically different environment where they can be osmotically deflated, they can become very floppy and exhibit a wide range of shapes. Like here, just, like a, uh, just a floppy shape, and here are just more like stomatocyte shapes. When these floppy, osmotically deflated vesicles are placed in flow, it turns out that they behave in ways, they deform in ways that look very similar to droplets, but there are still important qualitative differences. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you just some pictures of droplets and vesicles deforming in flow, and we're going to look at a very specific flow that's known as a hyperbolic flow field. I'm sure you guys know all this very well, but you know, a hyperbolic flow field typically is found whenever you have flow, flow through a contraction or expansion or have some type of impinging flow. And this is very important in describing, for example, breakup. Okay? So here's what I'm going to... So if we have a droplet placed in an extensional field, what ends up happening is beyond a critical extension rate, the droplet will start extending indefinitely as shown here. Now for vesicles, there have been two types of experiments that have been performed so far. Um, one for highly deflated vesicles that are very much like a tubular type of vesicle and one for moderately deflated vesicles or intermediate aspect ratio. So for these highly deflated vesicles, it turns out the shape transitions look very similar to the droplets. But there are a couple of important qualitative differences. First of all, we see that the shape is much more like a dumbbell-like than a droplet. And second of all, we see beads forming in the central thread of the vesicle, which are known as pearls. Now, typically, pearling occurs for droplets only when you turn off the flow, and that allows the Rayleigh plateau mechanism to come into place. Here, this happens during the flow process. Okay? Um, for moderately deflated vesicles, we see that the shape transitions are qualitatively different. I mean, they basically transition to asymmetric dumbbells. So at the beginning of my PhD, um, some of these experiments were performed, but there wasn't much understanding about what are the physics behind um, these different transitions, and what are the quantitative conditions under which these would occur. So what we wanted to do was perform a combination of theory simulations and microfluidic experiments to really get at this in much more detail. Yeah? And the people do these experiments, how do you keep the body near the hyperbolic point? Why don't they um, so you typically do what is known as a cross-slot microfluidic experiment. You have like a, you know, a T-shaped device, mm -hmm. you have two impinging flows, mm -hmm. and then you have an outlet. Mm -hmm. And what happens is if you can adjust the hydrostatic pressure 
between mm -hmm. the outlet, you can move the stagnation point okay. and control them. And that's a, those are exactly the type of experiments that we did cool. in this. Yeah. Yeah. They're pretty difficult experiments to do, but you know they're actually pretty cool. <laughs> All right. So here's just a brief outline of what, uh, oh, brief overview of what he did during the PhD. So first thing I'm going to do is talk about this, um, what happens for these moderately deflated vesicles that undergo this asymmetric shape instability. Then I'll talk about what happens for these more highly deflated vesicles that stretch out symmetrically and eventually form pearls. All right? So here are just the details of some of the simulations we're going to do. What we're going to do is we're going to take a vesicle, place it in a hyperbolic flow field shown here, and then solve for the forces on the surface of the vesicle. Once you know the forces on the surface of the vesicle, you can evolve the shape over time and see what type of shape it goes through. Now, in all the experiments performed, these are about 20 to 50 microns in size in an aqueous solution, so we're clearly in the Stokes flow regime. Therefore, we can use any standard technique to solve for the Stokes equations. We use a combination of either the boundary element methods or multipolar expansions, okay? Now, in order to solve for the force on an interface, we need to have a, one, a constitutive relationship that describes the elastic nature of the lipid violet. The right? simplest model that people um, use is known as the Helfrich model. This basically states that the energy of the lipid bilayer has a bending energy component, or kappa is known as a bending modulus. And the lipid bilayer tends to have very strong resistance to dilatational deformation. So we can, for a first approximation, treat the membrane as completely incompressible. All right? So under this condition, we'll have that the viscous stress due to the flow on the surface is going to be balanced by the elastic stresses on the surface in the membrane. In all the experiments performed so far, the viscosity contrast between the inner and outer fluid are exactly the same, so we're going to assume, they're exa we're going to assume viscosity ratio is equal to 1 for the remainder of this talk. Now, given this, um, this setup of the problem, there's only two dimensionless numbers that describe the dynamics of the vesicle underflow. There's a capillary number that's based on the bending modulus of the lipid bilayer, and then there's a so-called reduced volume, which tells you the degree to which a vesicle is deflated. This is the number between 0 and 1. A reduced volume of 1 means that we have a perfectly spherical vesicle. A reduced volume much less than 1 means that we have a very high surface area to volume ratio, which means that it's highly deflated and ends up becoming much more like a tube. Okay? So here are the details of the experiments that we're going to perform. What we did is we, we made a, vesicle, a suspension of vesicles using a technique known as electroformation. These are DOPC membranes uh, that are fluorescently dyed with NBDPC. We will flow the suspension of the, the suspension of deflated vesicles into a microfluidic cross slot device, which creates a high, local hyperbolic flow field in the middle. Now, if you're clever enough, what you can do is you can adjust the pressure difference between the inlet and outlet. If you're really derpy, what you would do is you just have a lab jack and you can adjust the hydrostatic pressure. All right. But the idea is you can you can do have some degree of control of the trapping, and then you can observe the vesicles as they deform and flow as a function of time. All right. So here are just the details of our analysis. Um, this is a, a our, our simulations predict that uh, that, interim, that moderately deflated vesicles will become linearly unstable to shape perturbations above a critical flow rate. All right, and this ends up and this and this is the most unstable mode predicted by this linear stability analysis. This looks actually very similar to the experiments that were done by Sput and Muller, as well as some of the experiments that were done by us. Um, when I was in Susan Muller's lab. Yeah. Well, what's nice about having a, a theory is that we can actually predict the conditions under which this mode will become unstable and get a stability diagram. So here's just the critical capillary number at which we observe an instability. And this is the reduced volume, which tells you the degree to which a vesicle is inflated. And we see that our uh, theories are able to capture um, what's observed in experiments uh, reasonably well. Now, the mechanism of this instability is actually uh, quite uh, straightforward. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the vesicle that's indicated by the black line here and perturb it by its most unstable mode, which is indicated by the red line. Where we pinch the vesicle, what ends up happening is that we'll get a local increase in pressure in this region um, that's, uh, that looks very much like a Laplace pressure. This will try to drive flow from this pinched region to the uh, extended region. But there's bending resistance in the membrane, and the bending resistance creates an adverse pressure gradient and tries to equilibrate it. Well, essentially, if you're above a critical flow rate, you'll only see this type of thing occurring. This is essentially a modified Rayleigh plateau instability, but it's a little bit more complicated because the fact is that the tension of the membrane depends is coupled to the flow. And we describe this in much more detail in one of our GFM papers. All right? 
So now let's just talk about what happens for these more high, high aspect ratio vesicles that undergo these other instabilities. All right? So what we're going to do here is just look at, uh, look at various types of vesicles at, under mod at various types of insulations under, um, under flow. And we see that there's actually two major families of deformations here. Um, for um, high reduced volume vesicles, so moderately deflated, basically what happens is when you um, increase the flow, it tends to some ellipsoid-like shape. For these highly tubular vesicles, when you spread them in the flow, they become much more like a dumbbell. This is actually read, more readily apparent if you look at, for example, the aspect ratio, say you say aspect ratio of the vesicle as a function of the extension rate for very uh, highly reduced volume. So high reduced volume, essentially, you don't see much change in the aspect ratio. But for low reduced volume, the aspect ratio increases quite a bit and diverges an apparent critical capillary number. Beyond this critical capillary number, there's no steady state shape anymore. Um, and it just extends indefinitely, as shown here. This, this, this looks actually very similar to uh, what happens for droplets. And if you look at the very old literature by Akervos and Barthez Bezo, you found that beyond a critical capillary number, no, you have almost some type of divergence, and you have a no steady state shape. And this is exactly what's happening here. So you assume a similar type of uh, physics that's happening here. So I wanted to see how reasonable these type of uh, this other type mechanism agrees with the experiments. Uh, luckily, Kanzler, Segre, and Steinberg performed some cross microscopic cross lot experiments of these highly of these highly deflated vesicles and basically predicted the critical conditions under which they observe this instability. So Y-axis is critical capillary number. This is the initial aspect ratio, which is just related to the reduced volume of the vesicle. All right. So process our experiments. The blue curve is our asymmetric one mode, asymmetric mode, and this is the second mode that we observe, which stretches out symmetrically and there's no steady state shape. What's great about the fact that if you have a highly deflated vesicle, it looks very much almost like a cylinder under very high deflations. So you can perform even scaling analysis based on slender body theory. And if you go through the map, turn the crank, you get this, uh, you get something like this. Now, the last thing I just want to talk to you about for this particular story is um, what happens when you see um, purling. So when the, when the vesicle is being stretched out and the neck starts becoming fairly thin, what happens is you can get beads forming in the central thread, which are known as pearls. This is a secondary instability that occurs on top of the other instabilities that I've been talking about. And it depends quite a bit on the thinness of the thread and the tension, et cetera. So again, this concert segre and Steinberg luckily had uh, predicted conditions under which they observed this. And our simulations are able to predict this as well. But I want to point out that because this is a secondary instability, um, the, 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 the stability, instability depends quite a bit on the flow history, the initial conditions, and all that. And we describe this in much more detail in a GFM paper that we wrote up, um, looking at, for example, the number of pearls formed based on the initial condition, the rate at which pearls forms, etc. And you're more than welcome to look at that. So the summary of this portion of the talk is that um, you know, vesicles are very interesting. They, uh, they undergo some very unique shape transitions placed under flow due to the fact that they have some type of phospholipid bilayer, a complex membrane that droplets don't have. We were able to characterize all, this, all the conditions using simulations. And, we were able to act, and the simulations are able to capture what has been observed experimentally. Um, some of the experiments are even performed by us. All right. So this leads us to some of the stuff we're thinking about doing in the future. So if you look very clearly closely at the droplet literature, it's very well known that the stability of droplets depends quite a bit on the flow type, the flow history, and also the geometry in which the droplet resides. Now, if you look at suddenly things that are like more of these uh, cellular-like systems or vesicles, etc., these type of questions haven't really been well addressed. Um, so what I have, I have a graduate student right now, a talented graduate student, who's very much interested in looking at vesicles and mixed flows, trying to characterize the shapes that the vesicles undergo under various types of flow rates, from shear to pure extension, and also considering the conditions under which they become mechanically unstable. I'm also collaborating very closely with Charles Schroeder at University of Illinois um, to try to understand how do vesicles behave when they're really far away from equilibrium, when they've highly stretched them out. Some things we're thinking about are looking at double step strain experiments so we can really interrogate how does the flow history affect these dynamics, and also um, large amplitude oscillatory extension flows. 
Now, in order to be able to get uh, to be able to do these experiments, we need to have a very fine control of um, of the vesicles in these cross slot devices. Um, luckily, Charles Schroeder has developed a really nice device um, where you can where they can they developed a, basically an automatic feedback control system to move this stagnation point, uh, move the stagnation point, and you can control the dynamics of the particle in in real time very easily. This is an example that's known as a Stokes trap. So here are some things that we're thinking about. Now that we can trap the vesicle for a really long period of time, we can trap them under flow and stretch them out for a really long period of time, super far away from equilibrium. What's interesting is we don't actually see breakup, even under these really high strains. And then um, if we let go, we can watch them relax and try to understand the relaxation behavior of these phospholipid bilayers. We can stretch them out and flow afterwards and try to understand what happens during, how does the strain history affect this. It turns out we find that the membrane reorganization during these highly strains changes the mechanics of the membrane completely, and we're still trying to investigate this in more detail. Yes? What's the radius of the thin strand relative to the bilayer thickness? Uh, so the bilayer thickness is roughly five nanometers thick, um, and so this one is going to be, it's like you, it's, it's going to be much larger still, but it's going to be you know, maybe a micron or two, uh -huh. right? Yep. Some other things we're thinking about right now are looking at the effect, you know, for these soft, soft, soft systems, they, are, they thermally fluctuate. So we want to understand how does thermal fluctuations, you know, modify the transport of, the active transport of particles on surfaces and inside even these uh, systems. So we're at the moment trying to develop some boundary element simulations to understand this in more detail. Now, a lot of you have already done, talked about some really interesting things about cells during your talks. And you know that cells are way more complicated than whatever I'm talking about right now, right? There's a lot of more inputs, a lot of gunk in the interior, like active, like an acting cortex and cytoplasm. But even for cells, they also have a membrane that's still very different than that of, of vesicles. They have, you know, like, uh, for example, uh, um, polymers that are polymerized on the membrane, etc. So some things that we're thinking about, we need to really get some better idea about how does interfacial rheology of general elastic shells alter the dynamics of droplet-like systems. So given that motivation, um, I'm trying to understand right now uh, how does complex interfaces alter the dynamics of droplets in general. And here I'm going to talk about some work that I did on the side um, in the last semester. I'm trying to answer one very specific question. They don't understand how does surface viscosity alter the dynamics of droplets under flow. These are pencil paper theories, and you want to know how does it alter the translational speed of the droplet, the deformation of the droplet, the rheology, and even the breakup. Okay? So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the work we did here. So what exactly is a complex interface? A complex interface is an interface <coughs> whose dynamics cannot be described simply by surface tension. And there are many examples of which are found in the in industry and also in biology. Some examples include foam stabilized by surfactants, lipid bilayers, biomembranes, biofilms, liquid crystalline films. Now, in all these examples, the reason why many of these interfaces are deemed complex is that they have some type of colloidal or uh, macromolecular architecture that separates the two fluid phases. And depending on the packing and orientation of the constituents, it can give rise to internal stresses that can't be described simply by tension. Now, from a continuum mechanics perspective, all types of complex um, interfaces will exhibit um, additional degree of, uh, of essentially resistance to different modes of deformation, right? Whether there's shear deformation, dilational deformation, out of plane bending. Now, vesicles typically experience out of plane bending resistance and strong dilational resistance. But here we just want to make some very general statements about how does additional resistance to the shear and dilation alter the dynamics of droplets, all right? So the model system that we're going to be looking at is just a droplet with a concentrated layer of insoluble surfactant. If the concentration on the surface is very large, what ends up happening is that you know, the, when the surfactants start moving past each other on the surface, they experience, they'll give rise to additional viscous dissipation or friction on the surface that can be described by some type of interfacial viscosity. All right? In the simplest way, how people describe interfacial viscosity is using a constitutive model that's known as the busnes scriven law. Briefly, if you were to look at the surface of a droplet, it says that the traction due to the external fluid is going to be balanced by the internal stresses on the surface of the droplet. And the internal stresses, which is known as surface stress, has three contributions, the interfacial shear viscosity, 
an interface of dilational viscosity, and a surface tension term. Right? Now, I just want to point out there's many different ways that people measure interfacial shear viscosity. Um, you know, Todd Squire's lab and Derry Fuller's lab are experts in this. They've done work on micro buttons, interfacial stress rheometer, 2D capillary viscometer. The main point I just want to make is that typically interfacial shear viscosity is not significant unless the surface pressure is considered really large. In other words, you have fairly concentrated layer of surfactants. Okay? Now, there are also many methods to measure the interfacial dilational um, rheology. And it's all based on the idea of this oscillating bubble tensiometry, where you just you know, oscillate a bubble back and forth, measure the pressure versus displacement, and get the G prime and G double prime. So here's just the problem that we want to look at. We want to basically know how does interfacial viscosity alter the dynamics of a droplet in flow. We're going to assume that the droplet's small enough that we're in the Stokes flow regime. And we're going to make the second assumption that, that, that we're going to have very little surface concentration and homogeneity. So for right now, the interfacial viscosities are relatively constant on the droplet. We will later relax this assumption and see what happens. But right now, let's start with the simplest assumptions possible. All right? A couple of questions we're going to know is how does interfacial viscosity alter the droplet translation, droplet deformation, breakup, and rheology? Now, given this model, there are four dimensionless numbers that describe the dynamics of the droplet underflow. There's the viscosity contrast between the interior and exterior fluid. There are two Boussinesse numbers that tell you the ratio of the interfacial viscosities to the outer viscosity. And then there's a capillary number which tells you the degree to which a droplet will deform under external shear flow. All right? So let's look at, for example, droplet translation. Now, droplet translation with interfacial viscosity has been studied um, quite a bit in the past. Um, and people have looked at, for example, droplet speed under trapped sedimentation, pressure gradient, thermophoresis, and dielectrophoresis. In all these examples, what they did was they saw for the soak slope inside the droplet and outside the droplet, uh, evaluated the drag on the surface, and when they went through the, the several pages of algebra, what they eventually found in all these examples that the translational speed is independent of the interfacial shear viscosity. It turns out that you can get the same answer um, using scaling analysis. And that's what's interesting about using scaling analysis is, A, it's a lot simpler than going through the pages of algebra. And, but another thing is it, can out, it, it gives you some physics and it can explain why interfacial shear viscosity is unimportant in this case, which is uh, kind of lost in some of these, um, these previous analyses. So let's just go through the scaling analysis in a bit more detail. So let's just say we have a droplet under some type of external field that's described by a vector L. All right? L can be gravity, pressure gradient, temperature gradient, etc. And let F sub u be the traction due to interfacial shear viscosity. Now, there's a couple of statements I want to make here. The first statement I want to make is if you look at the surface stress created by um, interfacial shear viscosity, um, it's due basically due to the surfactants sliding over each other on the surface and creating some type of friction. This friction creates equal and opposite forces. So if you were to sum the forces over, all, over the surface of the drop, it'll end up being zero. You can show this mathematically by essentially using the surface divergence theorem over the boussinesse scriven constitutive law, but this is just a physical manifestation of that. All right? So if you know that essentially the stress is created by this traction or force-free and linear with this external vector, it should scale as L dot I minus 3 and N, where the second tensor is the only tensor on the unit sphere that integrates to zero on the surface of the sphere. Okay. The second statement I want to make is that the stress is due to interfacial shear viscosity should be just in plane for you know, a sphere. So if it's in plane, that means it should scale as L dot I minus N. All right. Now, if both, these, both these statements are true, the only way for them to be physically consistent is if this traction is identically equal to zero. Now, if you were to go through all these papers and run through the algebra, they end, end up getting this exact same result. But you can show this essentially using two simple lines of scaling. All right. Now, you can do the exact same thing to understand the effect of dilational viscosity on the motion. Uh, what we're going to do here is look at a force balance on the surface of the droplet. And we'll say that the traction due to interfacial dilational viscosity plus the, plus the viscous traction <coughs> on the inner surface of the droplet is an equal to the sum of all the other tractions on the droplet. Okay? Now, if we use the same type of symmetry analysis as before, these are going to be force-free, should scale at, like L dot I minus 3 and N, which means that they can be lumped together. And hence, it, they can probably be, be lumped into an effective term. And if you go through a few lines of algebra, you can show that this left-hand side is equivalent to the viscous traction of a clean droplet, but with a modified viscosity contrast. 
So in summary, if we were trying to look at what is the translational speed of a droplet with interfacial viscosity, it basically is the same as a clean drop with a modified viscosity contrast. And there seems to be no dependence on the interfacial shear viscosity. Now, just to be very explicit, if we're looking, for example, a droplet under force, pressure gradient, the thermophoresis, you can look at the classical results in any textbook. All you need to do is replace this viscosity ratio of lambda with lambda star. And now you have the result, but now we have some type of interfacial viscosity. What's interesting is I actually was talking to Aditya Kayar a few weeks ago, and he mentioned to me that this, this type of symmetry analysis can also be true in time dependent Stokes flow. Um, because you know, we still have the same linear equations, the same type of symmetry analysis. So um, you know, if we look at, for example, Bassett forces, et cetera, you're likely to get similar type of effects here, just that this modified viscosity ratio is now going to be frequency dependent and a little bit more complicated. All right? Now, the, what, the, what I discussed in the past few slides made a lot of simplifying assumptions. Right? We assumed that there are no surface concentration and homogeneities, no droplet deformation, no hydrodynamic interactions between droplets. In the paper we wrote, we basically described how do all these three effects alter these results. And so what I'm going to do is just give you a very brief overview of how surface concentration from homogeneities alter these results. Right? So what we're going to do here is say that if you have a droplet under an external force, the, the, the flow created by this is going to sweep surfactants to the back of the droplet. All right? The ability of the surfactant to redistribute is, is described by a dimensionless number that's known as a surface Peclet number. It's a ratio of surface convection to surface diffusion or mass transfer from the bulk. Um, a large, small, small value of the surface Peclet number means we have very small um, surf surfactant redistribution. A large surface Peclet number means we have a very large redistribution of surfactants. So here what I'm going to do is just describe the results in the limit of low and high surface Peclet number. So for low surface Peclet number, we have very weak redistribution of surfactants, so the results are going to look very similar to that that we got before. We actually performed a perturbation analysis and found the next order correction. And if you look at the next order correction, it's still independent of the interfacial shear viscosity. The effect of the interfacial dilational viscosity can be described by just an apparent Boussiness number, which is just this Boussiness number plus the surface Peclet number times the Marangoni number of the drop. Okay? Now, for very large surface Peclet number, what ends up happening is you get very large redistribution of surfactants. Surfactants get basically swept to the very back of the droplet and it creates a small region of very high surface pressure that, where this region is essentially immobile. There's no, it's almost a no-slip surface. In this situation, what happens is you're going to have two regions. You're going to have essentially a region where all the surfactant is swept, so you have a, it's a clean surface. There's almost no interfacial viscosity here. And then you're going to have this region that's, almost, that's a no-slip surface, so interfacial viscosity is also in a, unimportant in this region. So if it's an unimportant in both regions, the results basically are independent of both. Right? So the results doesn't then depend on the shear and dilational modes, and you can just look at the standard results found in the literature. OK. Now, the last part of this talk, it's going to be two quick slides. Um, we also want to understand how does a droplet with interfacial viscosity behave in a linear flow field. Due to time constraints, I'm not going to go into this in very much detail. I'm just going to give you a very quick overview of what we did. We want to understand, for example, how does the, how, how does Interfacial viscosity alter the deformation of the droplet, the extra stress, breakup, etc. The strategy we're going to use is we're going to assume, first of all, small deformation, and then perform a perturbation uh, expansion in terms of capillary number to solve for the flow field inside and outside the droplet, as well as the droplet shape. We also did a small deformation analysis in the limit of high boost and nest number and high viscosity ratio, and you can get, you can get uh, an analysis as well. Now, current theories have looked at just leading order solutions so the, um, to the shape, et cetera. What we're going to do is we're going to look at higher order perturbation theories. And the reason why we're going to look at higher order theories is going to be readily apparent to be shown below. If you look at higher order theories, the reason why we're looking at higher order theories is that it turns out that many times low order theories does not do a very good job in describing how do the, the interfacial viscosities alter the the, the shape of the droplet. If you look at the inclination angle, you see it actually is very different than the exact simulation results from boundary element simulations, but updated theories are able to capture this. But another thing that's interesting is that higher order theories are able to describe other effects that leading order theories cannot. For example, we are able to get analytical expressions for the normal stress differences created by a suspension of droplets and how does interfacial viscosity affect this, which is important in describing, for example, lift of a droplet in shear flow near a wall. 
We can also describe uh, breakup, which is very similar to what Acker, Rose, and Barthes Wiesel did way back in the day in the 70s. And we can do the same thing um, with interfacial viscosity. So that's the end of this uh, long talk. I apologize if we're running a little past time. Um, but you know, I just want to thank so many people that helped me out. Eric and Susan have been awesome during this process. I've worked with really talented postdocs and graduate students. My students are great, and all my collaborators are awesome, too. <laughs> um, yeah, and this is the end of my uh, talk. I actually made two poems, so there's haiku and a limerick. So haiku is, vesicles and flow and other complex membranes have neat dynamics. And then the limerick is as follows. We made vesicles glow and then put them in flow. Watched funny shapes deform and escape, looked at the draft data and said, whoa. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, take one quick question before we head out. Anybody? Yeah. So in the first talk, we had all this great agreement with the theory and the experiments. And, you know, in a bilayer, you could have maybe the wrong amount of liquid trapped in one way from the other. There's this area different elasticity, very different elasticity models. Do you need any of that? Or is there a reason why you don't need that? Oh, okay. So uh, what I can say is, we were, so when we do electroformation, you do get some. We get a, you get a polydispersed suspension of vesicles, right? Many of which are going to be just single bilayer. Others are going to be multi-layer. Um, we were careful in the experiments to just take only the data that had single bilayer. We don't know exactly what happens when you have a multi-laminar vesicle. I'm saying even if it's a single bilayer, right? Yeah. Maybe the outer leaf is too compressed for the, yeah. for the shape. And maybe in the way of formation, that doesn't happen. Or yeah, so I don't know. We, we decided to just try the simplest thing possible, and it seemed to work. Um, but I do know that you know, the area difference elasticity model has been, been more successful in describing the equilibrium shapes of vesicles right, compared to this. Although even the very basic Helfrich model still is able to qualitatively capture most of the equilibrium right. shapes reasonably well. So. I think, you know, it, it's another layer of approximation uh, refinement that one can add, but I'm not so sure how much it will really it change. Necessary. Yeah, it doesn't seem so necessary, which okay. is great. I'm, yeah. yeah. But one thing I think would be very interesting, though, if you look at the stuff really highly away from equilibrium, it's very clear that we're not conserving area here. So we have to have, uh -huh. and we have, to have an area expansion modulus describe what's happening here. And even basic questions about whether it is, um, you know, whether it is, um, does you can treat it using linear elasticity or you have to use a nonlinear model, people don't fully know what's happening here. So I think that's something that's really interesting to look at. Mm -hmm. All right. Just yep. thank you. Uh, we'll have a short break for coffee. So go ahead. Yeah.